Welcome to video 5E. This video is about exclusions from income. So these are items we get to exclude from gross income and therefore taxable income. There aren't many. So recall that an exclusion means it's never going to be taxed. And of course, a deferral means it's going to be taxed later. And taxpayers love exclusions and like deferrals, right? So a deferral takes advantage of the timing variable, whereas an exclusion tends to be more of a conversion or character issue. So one of the primary excluded forms of income is municipal bond interest. So these are bonds issued by local and state governments in the U.S. And we should note that you can distinguish that from bonds issued by the federal government itself. U.S. government bonds actually are taxable federally, uh, whereas state and municipal bonds are not taxable federally. So fringe benefits are another giant exclusion from income. So a fringe benefit is a payment to an employee of something other than cash, right? Because if it's payment in cash, then it's just salaries or wages. So the value of these benefits is generally included in the employee's gross income as compensation for services. As we've discussed before, this is a, a strong presumption on the part of any transfer of wealth from an employer to an employee that uh, that's going to be considered gross income as compensation for services. However, there are certain fringe benefits called the qualifying fringe benefits, which can be excluded from gross income. Common ones are items like uh, medical and dental health insurance paid by your employer. Life insurance coverage up to a certain dollar amount, uh, again, can be paid by your employer and not included in the gross income of the employee. Then there are de minimis, uh, which really just means small benefits that can be transferred from uh, an employer to an employee. So these qualifying fringe benefits are really great. So again, common ones, uh, the employee provided health and dental insurance, life insurance up to $50,000. De minimis, um, which is tend to think of as really small things. Like, so let's say that you snuck in and used the office copier to make a couple copies of some documents you needed. Um, in theory, your employer provided a free service to you, you know, being able to make those copies and that would be included. But that's de minimis. It's difficult to track. The amount is fairly immaterial. Uh, another de minimis is if they have free coffee at your office, right? So there's a coffee station or, or you know, some small snacks that you can get. That's all considered de minimis as well. Meals and lodging at the employer's convenience. Uh, so let's say that you were the superintendent of a large apartment building, and of course you need to be on call to fix things. Uh, it could be that the owner of the building allows you to stay there for free. Or let's say um, that you work on an oil rig out in the Gulf of Mexico. Clearly your meals and lodging will be provided for you at the convenience of the employer because it wouldn't really be reasonable uh, for them to transport you back and forth to the mainland. No additional cost services. Uh, for example, airlines allow their employees to fly in any open seat for free. The idea is, well, look, the, the incremental cost of putting someone in an, a seat that was open anyway is nothing. I mean, there's a little bit of weight maybe, but for the most part, it's nothing. And so that can be a free transfer. Employee discounts, which we actually covered in the previous video, and uh, working condition fringes. So what I would suggest is Exhibit 5-3 on page 524 lists all these. We do kind of a light touch on fringes in Chapter 5. We're going to roll back around to these in Chapter 12 on compensation, um, but you should certainly familiarize yourself with them now. Okay, let's talk about some of the bigs. So medical and dental life insurance coverage. So uh, it's very common in the United States for an employer to at least pay for part, if not all, of the health insurance premiums for their employees and any of their employees' dependents. And so the employer gets to deduct that cost, right? So what's happening is the employer pays the premium direct 
uh, either through uh, a payment all their own or they have some withholding out of your pay to cover your share. But either way, the employer pays it direct. They take a deduction for the portion they pay. Uh, however, you do not need to include that in your gross income. So your employer is making a transfer of value. They're paying your insurance premiums. But the medical and dental life insurance coverage, you do not have to include as an employee in your gross income. We talked about uh, meals and lodging for the convenience of the employer. Uh, one of the things that the Tax Cuts and Job Act did starting in 2018 is the deduction that the employer takes is now reduced only to 50%. And then ultimately it's uh, intended to go to 0%. So uh, it's not quite as great of a qualified fringe benefit as medical and dental, where it's, it's tax-free to the employee and completely deductible to the employer. This is tax-free to the employee and only partially deductible by the employer. And moving expenses. So it used to be that uh, an employer could uh, relocate an employee and part of that cost um, could be borne by the employer and the employee did not have to include that in their gross income and yet the company could deduct it. However, uh, that's no longer a qualifying fringe benefit for anyone unless it's a move related to the US Armed Services. So corporate moves don't count anymore. It has to be related to armed services now. So others, uh, other exclusions from income, right, that aren't fringe benefits at this point. Gifts. So when you receive a gift, it can be an uh, inter vivos gift, which means during life, or an inheritance. These are not taxable to the recipient. Uh, now, we learned in the first module that there's this thing called the transfer tax that has to do with estate and gift. It could become part of the gift tax, but that is applied to the person giving the uh, amount, not the recipient. So let's say Bill Gates gives a $40,000 card to a homeless person. Assuming that Bill Gates has a detached and disinterested generosity, there is no tax for the homeless person, right? And instead, Bill Gates would have to consider whether or not there was any taxability from a gift or a state tax perspective, from a transfer tax perspective. All right, so as in the previous uh, video, here's a list of common exclusions um, that you can take a quick read through. And otherwise, uh, we're at basically the end. So in summary, you can see there are not many forms of business income that are excludable. So if you glanced through the chapter, because of course I didn't ask you to read all of it, you would see there are a number of other forms of individual income that are excludable. Those are generally discussed in Accounting 503. Um, and even though muni interest is given some attention, most businesses don't invest in municipal bonds. And that's for two reasons. First is it creates a limitation on the interest deduction. But more importantly, as we know, uh, there's an implicit tax and a corporation who's at 21 percent, probably it's not in their best interest to invest in municipal bonds because they're really built for a 37 percent or the highest individual marginal tax rate uh, clientele. There are some deferral provisions. We get into those more as we work our way through exchanges and property. Uh, there aren't a lot of deferral provisions for businesses, though. When you sell services or you sell inventory, there's a pretty good bet you're going to recognize the income. So uh, that's kind of why we focused on fringe benefits, because they're a transfer from businesses to employees. And that brings us to the end of video 5E. We move on to chapter 7 next. Thanks for watching.